Well, good afternoon, all. My name is Wayne Riley, President, Chief Executive Officer, and Professor of Medicine at Meharry Medical College. It's uh, my pleasure to welcome you again to Nashville and to this National Health Disparity Conference that is uh, focused like a laser beam this week on diabetes. Uh, this is a fantastic uh, manifestation of the outstanding working relationship the two academic health science centers in Nashville have together. And it's one that we think is a national model about collaboration, which we're very proud of. So on behalf of us at Meharry and Vanderbilt, to welcome again. Uh, today we're uh, very pleased uh, to have a distinguished member of Congress uh, speak to us this afternoon, and that is our own Jim Cooper, who represents the 5th Congressional District of Tennessee. Now, one thing that comes to mind when I think about Congressman Cooper is a uh, sports analogy. Many of you will remember the great uh, athlete, uh, pro athlete, Bo Jackson. And uh, there was an ad campaign that was uh, put out uh, around that time about 15 years ago that Bo knows this, Bo knows that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, Jim Cooper knows healthcare. If there's anybody in the United States Congress who understands the difficulty we face as practitioners of medicine, uh, nursing, uh, pharmacy, et cetera, it's the distinguished servant from the 5th Congressional District of Tennessee. And I'll tell you a little bit about Congressman Cooper. Uh, Jim was born in Nashville, but raised in Shelbyville, Tennessee, not too far from here as the son of legendary Tennessee Governor Prentice Cooper and Hortense Cooper. Jim's father served as governor of the great state of Tennessee for three two-year terms from 1939 to 1945. But those of us who know Jim Cooper know that he didn't rest on the laurels of his distinguished parentage uh, because he went on to earn a bachelor's degree from the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill as a Moorhead Scholar and then went on to Oxford University in England, where he was a Rhodes Scholar and received a BA and an MA degree. His studies then took him to the distinguished Harvard Law School, where he completed his Juris <coughs> Doctorate degree. He returned to his native Tennessee and then began a distinguished career as a businessman, a government official, and an attorney. And he was elected at the tender age of 28 to the Congress in the prior 4th Congressional District and served uh, for uh, six terms uh, representing uh, the 4th Congressional District. His uh, short sabbatical from the Congress was very productive and overwhelmingly the voters of the 5th Congressional District returned Congressman Cooper to office uh, where he now uh, represents over 700,000 Tennesseans in this part of Middle Tennessee. Um, his expertise, his knowledge, his uh, awareness of health care is so distinguished that none other than uh, the distinguished professor of business, Alan Enhover, who, Enhover, who was here last week, said that Jim Cooper is the smartest congressman on health care in the United States Congress. And I couldn't add anything but that uh, because those of us who work uh, with uh, Congressman Cooper know that he is one of the nation's thought leaders in the Congress on issues of health care. And today we're uh, very excited, Congressman, that you are going to talk about the public policy approaches to eliminating health disparities because in spite of all the work we do at these wonderful conferences, we need kindred spirits like Congressman Cooper to help guide the public <coughs> policy agenda that will support what we try to do on a daily basis. So Congressman Cooper, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, what a great introduction. I didn't mind him going on at length. That was <laughs> eloquent, gracious, really. I'm grateful to you. And I'm so proud of your leadership at Meharry. And I think this is a great partnership between Harry and Vanderbilt, and I appreciate all of y'all coming, especially those of you who came a long way. Now, um, you have to admit, uh, Dr. Riley was probably exaggerating in a few of his points, Fago. I bet some of you inside, at least, even though your facial expression remained the same, thought when he said, distinguished member of Congress, that's probably an oxymoron. <laughs> <laughs> 
Congress hasn't done a lot to distinguish itself recently. And uh, when he said, you know, I'm one of the smartest members of Congress on health care, I'm afraid that doesn't say a whole lot either. <laughs> <laughs> I always tell people I'm really not very smart about health care. I'm just pretty smart for a congressman, which is a heavy, <laughs> heavy qualifier. Um, there's so much to talk about today, and uh, these issues are so important. I hope you all don't mind me being a little bit controversial, because um, I think that it's important to speak truth to power, and I think that just the very topic of disparities raises a lot of very painful issues that aren't fun to talk about. So I hope you'll forgive me. I'm not trying to depress anybody, but I think it's about time we got results in this country. We've talked about it for a long, long time. So let me start by offending physicians. I'm glad there's so few in the audience, and those of you who are here, I'm sure are good-hearted, but when you read Steve Schroeder's recent lecture, the Shattuck Lecture, he points out, again, how little remedial health care has to do with health care status. It makes you wonder why we don't have a bunch of policemen in this room, or restaurant managers, or car dealers, or folks like that, who may do more to impact daily living in America, behavior, things like that, than anything else, uh, because that's the number one factor. Now, genetics, for the time being, we can't do a whole lot about. Socioeconomic status, we can do much more about. And sadly, today in America, we're facing some of the greatest income gaps and disparities that we've faced since the Roaring Twenties, or the age of the robber barons, the Gilded Age, what they used to call the Gay Nineties. That's no longer allowed. You know, it's amazing how we allow this decline in the middle class and the increase in the upper class and lower class. So there are a lot of things that aren't fun to talk about. When you raise issues like this, it makes you think, well, let's focus on public health, preventive care, all those good things. Uh, this is a healthcare business city, too. One of the leading healthcare venture capitalists in America told me one time when I presented to him a health care business plan on, focused on prevention, he said, don't you know that nobody has ever made a dime on preventing illness and disease in America? You know, is that cynical or is that realistic? Well, that's the way he felt, and he controlled $15 billion of investor capital on health care. So it's not worth getting depressed on that. It's worth thinking, well, say we do focus for a few moments on the 10% of your health status that is the result of remedial medical care. How about if we got our money's worth from that 10%? That's a radical thought. It's only 10% of the equation, but we are spending almost $2 trillion on that every year. So how about if we got our money's worth from that? And that would upset a lot of apple carts because as the Princeton sociologist Paul Starr wrote years ago, the fundamental equation in all healthcare is very simple. In fact, it's a truism that $2.1 trillion equals $2.1 trillion. <laughs> the amount we spend on healthcare absolutely and precisely equals the incomes of those who benefit from our current healthcare system, providers and insurers and others. And they are sometimes called vested interests who don't want any change in the system and who will never admit, even under torture, that <laughs> they are wasting part of that money. Some of them are wasting all of it, but let's just assume it's part. Well, that's kind of one discouraging line of inquiry there. Let's try another one. You're meeting in the state of Tennessee right now. And we're a great state. We're a proud state. And we recent had a, recently had a surge in our rankings. We shot up from 47th worst in healthcare in America to 46. <laughs> if they broke out Nashville as a city, we probably wouldn't even be better than that. Even though we're a nationally recognized healthcare capital with some of the finest hospitals in the country, with great medical schools, great providers, great everything. We may have too many doctors, if that's possible, but somehow the results are not there at the street level. So what do we do about it? Now, you know some of our habits here in the South. 
way too much tobacco, way too much fried chicken, and I won't even mention Jack Daniels or George Dickel <laughs> and some of our finer products like that. You know, the New York Times columnist, Maureen Dowd, who writes with an acid pen, she said, her two greatest enemies in life are gravity and french fries. <laughs> now, we can't do much about gravity yet. We don't understand much about that, but we can start dealing with the french fry problem. And it's amazing, sometimes you don't need to wait for the federal government to act. Look what New York City did with the ban on trans fats. That happened before most folks in Congress even knew what a trans fat was. <laughs> and they got them out of many of the restaurants and the finest eateries in the world in Manhattan. So there's a lot that we can do. Um, the uh, Tennessee is actually making progress on the tobacco issue. Our smokers here fell 15% in recent years. They may well fall more because of a state level and federal level tax increase almost one dollar per pack of cigarettes, which is a whopping increase. Part of that increase is on the S-chip bill, which has been before Congress now, and we're going back and forth with the president on whether we can override his veto or not. But that is the primary pay for in this bill for kids' health, and hopefully that higher price will discourage new kids from smoking, and may even wean some current smokers from their addiction. <coughs> this conference topic is primarily diabetes, also, of course, obesity, and I don't want to dwell too much on those issues because I'm sure you've explored them in greater detail than I could, but trying to be a student of psychology, we are all, even folks in this room, some of whom are psychi psychologists or psychiatrists or experts on human behavior, we're all in denial, right? You know, somehow, we can look in a mirror or look at the scales and still not get the message and that's a powerful thing. My sister-in-law is a flight attendant, and she is amazed every week when more and more people show up on the flights carrying their own seatbelt extenders because the existing seatbelt on the plane is not big enough for their girth. Now, you would think the time you bought for yourself or were given a seatbelt extender, that might be a time to start thinking about body mass index and things like that or perhaps a time to buy two seats when you fly on the airplane instead of one. But of course, you know, that is unheard of. There's a famous Tennessee uh, congressman, probably none of y'all have heard of now, but he's actually a legend in his own time. This is true. Uh, he had a first name, but his accepted first name, he campaigned as Fats Everett. Fats being his nickname. Tip O'Neill told me when I was first elected to Congress that Fats was the single most charming human being that he had ever met in his life, Irish or not Irish. That was a high compliment from Tip because <laughs> Tip could charm birds out of trees. Well, Fats would sit in the cloakroom and tell stories, usually on himself. And he told a story about one time he was in a county fair in West Tennessee. And those were in the days when they had scales at the fair uh, because they had to weigh, weigh cattle and things like that. The scales with sort of the big round dial and the needle that goes around. Well, Fats was at one of these fairs shaking hands and he thought nobody was looking. So he put his nickel on the scale and jumped on. He didn't realize, however, that two little boys were looking. Fats must have weighed three or 400 pounds, but the needle went around and around and around and stopped at 57 pounds. <laughs> And the little boys looked at each other and said, oh my gosh, he's hollow inside. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we are in denial. We must think we are hollow inside with the way we are behaving. We may be the first nation in the history of mankind to have to worry about overeating more than undereating. I don't need to tell you all about the seven year delay between onset of diabetes and disease and diagnosis, or what's even worse, once you have that scientific finding, the denial that we enter into for years afterwards as we pretend that the body is not being ravaged by this disease, that is such a silent killer, that has so many possible symptom manifestations, but may well end up robbing us one day of our sight, or our limbs. So, 
Uh, even the cost is discouraging. Y'all may have more up-to-date estimates. The most recent ones I found were from 2002. That's one of the beefs I have with healthcare is the data are so stale in this industry that it's kind of pathetic. In business, if you were to cite a five-year-old number at a conference, you'd be laughed out of the room. Here, this is like current information because our data is so antique. But even five years ago, it was a 92 billion a year in direct costs, 40 billion in indirect costs for a total of 132 billion dollars. If that's not a priority, you know we've got the wrong priorities. But we've got the wrong priorities. <laughs> I see Larry Marin here. He's one of my heroes because he's helped guide me to try to screen diabetics for retinopathy. And I don't know if you all recounted re the story here, Larry, about our. <laughs> the treacherous trail of legislation in Washington. You were looking right here at a former, and I left in good graces, a former trustee of the American Academy of Ophthalmology. Some of the highest paid specialists in the country, they're all fine, brilliant, wonderful people. They were smart enough to go into a branch of medicine that doesn't have much blood and gore. Um, we thought it would be not too hard to get ophthalmologists on board supporting diabetic retinopathy screening. No, no, I can't do that. We looked into it more closely. What's their objection? Well, there's something like a $90 payment, half for labor, half for film, and they thought well, you couldn't ever reduce that, you know, so that more people could get this screening. So they said, let's leave it like it is. And I said, well, this film part, you know, when was the last time you used film to take pictures <laughs> of your family? or in your practice or anything like that. Oh, we haven't used film for years. Nobody uses film. So why are you getting paid for film if you don't use it? You know, technology is supposed to bring great new things. Sometimes it increases cost. Sometimes, like in this case, it lowers cost, but you're not letting the cost go down. So when do the ophthalmologists start owning Kodak or all the other film companies and get their money? Well, they did, but they want that money and they will not let it go. And here you are, if these were poor hand-to-mouth physicians, I could <laughs> see them being worried, but these are some of the most prosperous in the country. But what's more important, personal income, public health, <coughs> personal income wins out. It's tragic too, and y'all know this better than I do, the health disparities with particular racial, ethnic groups, American Indians, Hispanics, African Americans. I think it's hard because, you know, we need more public education. There should be a shopping mall, a church, anything, or television set that doesn't have this on the screen. But somehow or another, people get the impression that strict blood sugar control is obsessive compulsive behavior. One of my son's favorite TV shows is Monk. I don't know if y'all ever seen that on TV. <laughs> Uh, and they think that if you're that clued in to your blood sugar levels, you must be kind of smart, crazy, like Monk. Well, where is the TV show that celebrates discipline and longevity and low infant birth rate, the low infant mortality rates and things like that? So I was going to urge our screenwriters who are currently on strike, that while they have a little <laughs> extra time on their hands, to learn a little bit about public health so that when they return to their jobs at higher pay, they can help inform us, because <laughs> most of the hot shows on TV, and I don't know them all, but there's ER, there's a bunch of hospitals, you know, people are tuned in. But all that does really is celebrate very expensive tertiary care, high-end remedial care, when it's too late. Where is the great show celebrating the public health nurse or the activists in the community? I have not seen it. There are a few uh, other things we need to talk about. I don't need to tell in the presence of two of the great medical schools of America that we are graduating not only too few primary care doctors, because most everybody wants to be a specialist, they make more money, people go where the money is. I'm not sure what Hippocrates would have thought of that, but still, uh, we're not only graduating too few primary care doctors, I think we're probably graduating too few doctors. But they all say, oh, we can't increase enrollment even though one of the medical schools I know of has celebrates an 18 to 1 faculty-student ratio. And no, that's not reversed. 18 teachers for every student. 
whoa, I never went to school like that. Mm -hmm. At Harvard Law School, I think they talked about 30 or 40 students for every one teacher. And of course, most of these folks really aren't full-time teachers. They're just wanted on their resume or something. Because I feel sorry for the students if each one has 18 teachers. <laughs> <laughs> The um, fixation on specialization is remunerative, but it is not helpful for our overall system. So what are we gonna do about it? Um, well, the scariest thing I've seen recently, and I don't know what y'all seen that's scary. I know that Halloween's over, but the CMS Community Tracking Study, let me quote this. It said, quote, a small percentage of physicians cared for a large majority of black Medicare patients. 20% of physicians were responsible for 80% of black Medicare patient visits. More importantly, this subgroup of physicians reported difficulties in providing high quality care to their patients." End of quote. Well, that reminded me what we've been seeing at the Medicaid level for years. Because remember, that quote was about Medicare. But in Medicaid, a full one third of all the physicians in America will not see any Medicaid patient, period. So the other two-thirds are virtuous, right? Uh-uh. Another third wants to see as few Medicaid patients as possible, although they will see a few. And that means that one-third, the remaining one-third, is basically all Medicaid. Now, is that fair? Is that right? Does that make more sense? That's why we need more physicians take care of more of the folks in this country who need medical care. When I first got involved in this issue years ago, I visited a clinic right across the river here in Nashville, and they had to recruit to that clinic in Nashville, Tennessee, a doctor from New York City, because we couldn't find one here locally. Well, how crazy is that? It reminds you, and I know physicians don't like this comparison, but if one third won't do the job that's expected of them and another third are probably shirking, that sounds a whole lot to me like either a work slowdown or a stoppage or perhaps even a strike. But these folks wouldn't belong to a labor union, you know that. That's not what you call the American Medical Association or any of the other societies. But if you refuse to see human beings in your community who need care and who have payment Maybe not what you would like, and I'll be the first to tell you that Medicaid doesn't pay enough. Why shouldn't you see those folks? Especially if you're in that one third that won't see any ever. What's your excuse? Are you shunned at cocktail parties? Nope. Is there any penalty for that behavior? No, they're only financial rewards. Because with all private insurance payment, you can do quite well. Because private insurance today for every American is forced to pay 115, 120% of real charges just to cross subsidize all the folks on Medicaid. So if all your patients are private pay, then you're getting that 120%. While some of your fellow doctors who graduated from the same medical school, same year, are getting paid 60, 70, 80% of cost to do their job. How is that fair? Well, there's some other things. If we were to require, and I know that's a radical thought, that everybody saw poor patients, that would have a miraculous effect on the profession. Because then you wouldn't believe how we'd be lobbied to raise Medicaid reimbursement. Because <laughs> see, when only one third of docs really care about that population, you're missing the lobbying strength of two thirds. Well, a full strength lobbying contingent from the doctor groups would help us a lot. Another touchy issue. This is from the McKinsey report that just came out, one of the best economic studies I've ever seen of healthcare. It just came out this February. It's available on the web, the McKinsey Global Institute. These are these real smart consultants who you would think would want to be hired by everybody, so they wouldn't want to offend anybody. Well, the beautiful thing about this McKinsey report is they go out and offend at least half the folks in healthcare because <laughs> they're telling the truth. And what they found vis a vis our physician friends is that American doctors make at least 50% more than the next best paid physicians on the planet. 50% more. Now I'm not against that, I think that's great. But I believe in pay for performance. 
are they 50% better? Many are. Some are not. In fact, it's probably like Garrison Keillor's thing, like Wobegon, where all the kids are above average. Probably another, another example of our denial is they all think they're above average. Of course, they're not. You know, Medicare today pays exactly the same fee to the person who's the worst surgeon in America and the best surgeon. It's a crazy, a mixed up system. So we have a deal right now where we're making 50% more, but we're not getting our money's worth. And think how one of the good Bush phrases, maybe the only good Bush phrase was <laughs> the bigotry of low expectations. Think how little we expect of our system that spends far more money on remedial medical care than any other system in the world. We don't expect results. Even the Healthy People 2010 numbers, we're playing catch up, folks. We would be outraged if any coach or sports team performed at this level. You know, we want excellence. We want to be number one, but we don't even aim for that in healthcare. There are a lot of other issues I could talk about, and I don't want to uh, strain your patience too much, but one course of action, and this is hard sometimes for our diabetes friends to admit because you all have the law of large numbers on your side. There are so many million Americans who either are afflicted or are likely to be afflicted by the disease that it's probably going to be taken care of more or less by NIH. There are tons of orphan diseases out there and diseases of smaller populations that have a much harder time. They look on y'all with envy because you've got a big disease to fight. And they have a little one. And every year, advocates for these diseases come to Washington. In fact, that's the large majority of folks we see these days. And sometimes they'll sit in my outer office and representing different diseases, they won't even talk to each other. That's not very nice. And then when they get in the office, they kind of have the idea that it's um, zero sum game. That if they win, somebody else might lose, but they want to win. And politicians are smart. They can pick up the vibrations and know, well, if you throw some money at a big disease group, well, then you get by the next election. Well, I don't think that's good enough. The Republican Congress deserves credit because under Newt Gingrich's leadership, they actually doubled NIH funding over a period of years but now it's been frozen or slipping. We're hoping for an increase this year, but it's nothing like doubling. We're facing situations where even Vanderbilt, with a perfect program on disparities, nearly had their funding yanked just because NIH ran out of money. What's a better way to do things? Sometimes healthcare people aren't very good at coordinating among themselves. And actually the disease groups are proliferating because we're finding subspecialties of diseases that each want their own lobby now so that you can take care of precisely your disease and no one else's. How about unity? I've asked the head of AARP this, Bill Novelli. How about if AARP or any other group, I don't care what the convening authority is, had a national convention of all the diseases in this country, and you kind of let words slip out, you wouldn't have to pay politicians to attend. We would fly, drive, crawl to get to that convention because that group would be speaking on behalf of two to three hundred million Americans who were unified because they wanted to fight illness and disease and public health problems, not just take care of their own medical condition. I went with the convening authority idea because one of the tragedies of any human organization is everybody wants to protect their turf. And there are a lot of folks fundraising for worthy causes who fundraise first to keep their own job and who really don't care if progress is being made. Another reason I went with a convening authority is the idea that you can't predict where science is gonna go. And we might devote all the money in the world to a particular disease, even a popular disease. And that'd be a blind alley because no one can tell where science leads. We had a study here in Nashville recently, it was celebrated on the front page of the newspaper, but I would have been kicked out of Congress if I had gotten an earmark for a study on frog sweat. Now, I'm not sure what makes frogs sweat. I'm not sure I want to know what makes frogs sweat. <laughs> but there is some miraculous chemical in frog sweat of a particular type of frog. 
that can save lives. Well, that just shows how among the many detours in science, you know, you might be funding one type of research, might be for a tiny little orphan disease, it might help diabetes. So why don't we get politicians out of the scientific research business and picking winners and losers? And the worst influence of all was the late Senator William Proxmire had the golden fleece disease, or it was a disease, but <laughs> press conferences, basically ridiculing all the medical research because it gave people the idea, because he'd have these monthly press conferences, that it's silly to study that. Well, I prefer the researcher opinion, not the politician's opinion. We've thought of reversing that, uh, having golden egg awards, showing the unexpected benefits of science. Like, if I were to tell you right now, go chew on the bark of a willow tree, you would think I was crazy, but that's a component of aspirin. If I said go study tree fungus, I would be equally crazy, but that is penicillin. You know, we've got to get over this political making fun game of, of scientific research. But you know what's happened after two years of working on the Golden Egg Project? We can't get the scientists to agree <laughs> on worthy projects for monthly press conferences. They're all so jealous of each other and thinking small, not thinking big. But there are a lot of other issues we could talk about. I don't want to uh, uh, belabor it, but I am proud. I'm a co-sponsor of HR 333. How many threes are there? Three, 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 three. The Minority Health Improvement and Health Disparity Elimination Act. That's great. Ted Kennedy's on it. It looks like a worthy cause. Don't get your hopes up, folks. Because in my opinion, as great as that bill is, and it's a step in the right direction, it's not nearly bold enough. There are a lot of other things we're doing that aren't nearly bold enough. Because if you're really talking about making progress, it involves changing everything. Your lifestyle and political lifestyles. And nobody's talking about that. Like, Congress should lead by example, right? How many obese congressmen are there? Well, you don't want to even want to ask. Uh, that and divorce are the two occupational hazards of being in my profession. <laughs> um, so these are vital issues. I appreciate your coming to Nashville to discuss them, and hopefully we can make progress on them. Don't accept second best. Don't even accept what is considered today to be first best. Because until we get results, people living longer, people living healthier, we cannot quit. Until you've upset lots of apple carts, broken some china, not here in the hotel, but elsewhere, um, we should not rest easy. So thank you for being here, and let's make progress together. Thanks.